We're here with uh, Russell Banks, author of Lost Memory of Skin. Uh, thanks for being here. Yeah, good to be here, Chris. Um, I wanted to ask you, your main character, the kid, is kind of difficult to describe. I often describe him as a convicted sex offender who's also a virgin. Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about him? Yeah, that sounds like a lead into a Saturday Night Live routine or something. Yeah. He's an innocent in a way, but um, he's also, as he at one point thinks of himself, as a feral child. I mean, he doesn't use the word feral because that word would not be part of his vocabulary. Uh, but he's a kid who essentially has raised himself, and over the time, you know, he's so lonely and alienated, he gradually becomes addicted to the internet, and then through that, addicted to pornography, and, and he's lost in the digitalized world, in a way. Uh, we meet him when he's 22 years old, and we don't know what he's done uh, to be a convicted sex offender. Um, he's wearing a GPS ankle bracelet so he can be monitored. He's living, he's homeless, he's living with other convicted sex offenders under a causeway in South Florida. Uh, because he can't live anywhere within 2,500 feet where there are um, children. And, you know, he's the kind of person that we would rather not think about um, in many ways, and who's, uh, we'd like if he remained invisible to the rest of us, but he's like an awful lot of people, you know, and an awful lot of, of kids of his generation, too. So he happens to be a character I developed great affection for, or I couldn't have spent the three years you know, in close contact with him uh, that it took to write the book, but uh, because he's honest, he's basically an honest, decent human being who happens, he's also witty, he's also got a kind of wry sense of humor and take on things, even his own awful plight. When you first hear what the book is about, you have sort of your automatic assumptions and then you start to read about him and I develop sympathy for him, I assume that you have Oh yeah, sympathy definitely. For him. You know, and you couldn't unless I did. I mean, in a way, I think that's true for any work of fiction. If the author doesn't have affection and respect, uh, uh, compassion for his or her characters, you can't expect the reader to either. Now right. this is based on a real place, right? Right. I live uh, part of the year, um, the winter months, uh, in South Florida. In, in, uh, actually in South Miami Beach and uh, on the bay looking toward the Miami skyline and from the terrace of my condo I can look out and I can see the Julia Tuttle Causeway which crosses from the mainland to Miami Beach and uh, about four years ago news reports started trickling out of a colony of, of men living down there with the um, not just the permission, but the compliance and the and the and the contrivance of the local um, authorities, police and, and uh, legal authorities, were dropping them off there, and that was the only place they could live. And they were clustering together, and they had created a kind of yeah tent city or shanty town uh, underneath the bridge. Well, that kind of was the opening, and gradually other aspects of the question started to come into it, like you know, like the digitalization of our erotic lives, the, the, the proliferation uh, and enormous expansion of the uh, pornography industry through the internet primarily, and, uh, and also kids getting hooked on it at a very early age. And I mean literally hooked, I mean hooked, like addicted uh, to it um, at a very early age. So as I, as I did research and followed the subject out, uh, it became increasingly uh, dense and, and mysterious to me and, and, and worthy it, it, as it came to seem uh, from, of, of me really plunging into spending a lot of time and energy trying to understand. So in a way the real bad guy in this book is the internet on some level. Do you, do you feel like that's true or? Well the kid, yeah, I mean the kid gets down to it. He has this kind of rudimentary uh, almost primitive understanding of the Bible. For the first time in the course of the, early in the novel, he's by accident ends up reading the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, the first couple of books. And uh, he's trying to figure out how to apply it to his own life. And, and at some point he says that he seemed, it's as though the, um, uh, the serpent was the internet and um, the forbidden fruit is pornography. And in some way he, he's, he's, he's trying to come to some ethical, moral understanding of what's happened to him and happened to the world around him. And, and 
that, that metaphor that he plucks out of the Bible explains it to him. So yeah, in a sense, that's true. The internet is the serpent in the garden, and, um, and the, uh, the pornography is the forbidden fruit, and it's tempted into tasting, only instead of bringing him knowledge, it brings him, in a sense, ignorance. Um, the, the lost memory of skin. <laughs> there's a there's a scene in the book, and it's one of the stranger scenes, at least it was for me to read, and it's actually of a photo shoot with children in it, and it seems to be saying something about sort of normal society, uh, that that the things that we take, sort of take for granted as being normal, yeah. uh, maybe actually contributing to this sort of thing. Yeah, the, the, I think there are two aspects of that, that particular shoot, and I tried to keep it hovering between between on the one hand a commercial uh, you know a televised commercial uh, being filmed and a porn film being made and it's not quite clear which it is the kid can't quite figure it out and um, the other character there the professor he can't quite figure it out uh, which it is the parole officer is there she decides right away well it's child porn they're making porn here uh, professors think, no, no, it's just an advertisement. The kid's not sure which it is. Uh, and I think that what, what is being dramatized there is, um, and I'm not trying to be preachy about it, is that, is that there, is a, there isn't a great distance between the two when sex is used, and especially the, the, the eroticizing of children, is used to sell consumer goods uh, to children or to parents, to children through their parents. And, um, and that's a part of the story. It's, it's like the environment has become so eroticized in order to sell goods. And children have become such an enormous segment of, in fact, the single largest segment of the consumer economy that the two start to blend at a certain point. And um, and, and that particular scene, yeah, it's a strange scene. It's a kind of a very elaborately choreographed scene. And, and it's deliberately kept um, a little vague as to what's really going on here. It depends on who's perceiving it, really. Um, is there a Treasure Island connection because of the treasure maps and... and funny you should ask, yeah. Well, this, this is fairly early on. I, I had this young guy who was childlike, not quite an adult, sort of innocent, but not really innocent. Uh, and I had this older man who was sort of physically uh, peculiar, let's say, uh, and who was protecting him in a custodial way, but also was a slightly menacing figure too, and mysterious and with secrets and lies and so forth behind him. And I realized, I said, I said wait a minute, this is reminding me of the book I loved as a child, which was Treasure Island, Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. I went back and reread it. Also, I had, yeah, I had these images floating around of buried treasures and maps and so on. Right. Just playing with it, and went back and reread it, and I thought, "Whoa, this is really, really good." A, it's really well written. I had forgotten, or I didn't even know when I read it as a kid. And um, I thought, "Well, you don't have to reinvent the wheel here. You know, it's quite possible that you can learn from something that Stevenson did, who obviously learned from something else and learned. This is an old story; it goes back to Cervantes and before. And um, and so I." Um, yeah, I, I just sort of tried to integrate some of the elements of, of uh, Treasure Island into into the novel. It's not as though I'm burying illusions for future PhD candidates to write dissertations <laughs> on. It's just, just using it as a way to help structure the story. This is another question that uh, I, I'm going to ask it, and I'm not asking you to sort of aggrandize yourself or anything, but um, do you? it seems like you tackle subjects that a lot of writers wouldn't tackle. And you, do you feel that that's true about yourself? I mean, I've seen it written about you yeah. and by other people. Yeah. yeah. I guess so. I don't set out to do that. Uh, I'm really following my deepest curiosity, um, what's really mysterious to me, what's most difficult to understand is what I want to write about. I don't want to write about what I already understand, what I already know. Uh, that's boring to do, uh, spend two or three years writing about something you already know about. But to go where I haven't gone before and what I don't understand, and to do it by means of, explore it by means of writing artistic literary fiction, it seems to me to be the only way I can penetrate that mystery, the only way I can come to an understanding of a character like the kid, of a world like the kid's world. Or in other books, the same kind of thing with Rule of the Bone or with Cloud Splitter, the world of a terrorist, uh, the world of, you know, 
all kinds of worlds out there and, and um, that I don't understand them except as I can access them through writing of fiction. And um, so I, that's what, that's my sort of my modus operandi and, and it's not really a, um, a program or, or conscious intention, it's just avoiding becoming bored. What, why did you decide not to give your characters names? Well, a couple of reasons. Um, one is, one of the themes that runs through it, of course, is the theme of false identity and of secrets and so forth. And, um, and, and, and by having names that were not the true names, but you knew they weren't the true names, um, kind of points in that direction. Another reason was, I, is that it, I wanted to sort of raise it up out of the level of sort of nitty gritty realism and bring it toward the level of fable if I could and, and make it the story a little more universal and not just a story of public expose, et cetera, et cetera, a social realist kind of novel, but one that, that reached towards myth a little bit, uh, certainly toward fable and having a kid and the professor and the wife and the uh, rabbit and the shyster and so forth. I think it works. I mean, a few pages into it seems a little strange perhaps, but pretty soon the kid becomes not just his name, but who he is. Yeah, yeah but thanks for talking to me again, and uh, yeah. come back as many times as you want. That's good to know. Thank you. Right. Great, thanks.